Hey, everybody. Welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Got a great show for you tonight. Make sure you tell me hello. Let me know where you're watching from. And uh, thanks for all of you who have wished us uh, all your well wishes over the storm. We had a, a you know major storm here in Texas. We're not used to that nine degree weather like so many other parts of the country, but we're all doing just fine. My team and I uh, all made it through okay um, and safe. So thanks for your thanks for your well wishes. We're going to be talking tonight about a very critical nutrient. And I, I've been wanting to talk about this one for a while, just haven't, uh, hasn't worked itself into the rotation, and that's potassium. It's one of the few nutrients that taking supplemental potassium is not really super effective, and we'll talk about why, stay with me. But uh, this mineral, which is in a, in one of the key essential electrolytes, can kill you if you have a deficiency. This mineral can cause heart disease and all kinds of other problems. So we're going to be diving into why you need to understand potassium. Many of you are taking medications that deplete potassium and don't even realize it because your doctor didn't have that conversation with you. So I'm going to give you a crash course on this very vital and essential nutrient so that you can understand it, so that if you are doing something that's depleting it, you can get it corrected. So without further ado, let's dive into potassium. So some of the key functions of potassium plays a lot of roles, but these are some of the most important. So fluid balance. So it helps as an electrolyte, it helps maintain hydration and, and your fluids. Um, as an electrolyte, it has an effect or it pulls an osmotic effect on water. So it keep, can keep you hydrated. Now on this note, I want to talk a little bit about, about water because many of you are using a reverse osmosis water filter. And that's, that's actually a very good filter, by the way, RO, it's oftentimes referred to as RO filtration, is a great way to filter your water, especially if you live in the city. And the reason why is, is that RO is really one of the only flu, uh, filters that pulls fluoride out of the water. And you wanna pull that toxic fluoride out of the water because it's a neurotoxin. And we see here, nerve function, potassium plays a role in that too. But fluoride is not good for you. But the problem with RO is it depletes the water of electrolytes. So RO will also filter out potassium. And if your diet's low in potassium and you're not getting much potassium from your water, but you're a super heavy water drinker, maybe you're eat, you know, drinking 64 plus ounces a day, you can actually create a greater degree of dehydration. And part of that is because you do get some potassium from water. Uh, not a lot, but you do get some. And so that it's important if you're using RO filtration that you add in, you want to add an electrolyte back to your drinking water um, if you're using an RO filter. And one of the one if you're looking supplementally to do this, I recommend something called ultra electrolytes, which is a liquid, and you can add about a half a teaspoon in that of that liquid into for every 20 ounces of water that you drink and you're adding back in the, the electrolytes, including potassium. So it plays a key role in the fluidic balance. It plays a role in nerve function. Potassium is, again, the term electrolyte oftentimes is, is really focused on fluids and, and fluid and hydration, but the term electrolyte also refers to uh, these, these minerals that help to balance how well your nerves can communicate with each other. Um, your potassium and your sodium play this inner exchange between cell membranes to allow your nerves to properly function. And so if you, if you are struggling with, with potassium deficiency, your nerves won't communicate as well. And where we'll actually see this manifest, we'll see this manifest as uh, brain fog and fatigue. We'll see this manifest as muscle spasms or cramps uh, because your, your nerve and your muscles require uh, require potassium again for that neurological action. We'll also see um, with nerve function, we'll see things like heart arrhythmias. So if you have heart palpitations, heart skipping a beat, that type of thing, remember that's also an electrical or a neurological function of potassium. Potassium also regulates blood pressure. Now that's critical to know because, and we'll talk about this in depth in a minute, many people take blood pressure medicines, right? So if you're on a, a, a diuretic, as an example, one of the most common 
potassium depleting diuretics is called hydrochlorothiazide. So you, you may be on hydrochlorothiazide, oftentimes abbreviated that way, and that's a diuretic that will drop your potassium, right? But potassium lowering potassium causes an increase in blood pressure. Let's change our color here. It causes an increase in blood pressure. So again, if you're taking a diuretic to lower your blood pressure, you could actually be affecting your blood pressure by lowering your potassium. We'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit uh, more in just a minute. And then carbohydrate metabolism. Potassium is critical for proper insulin production. Potassium is critical for blood sugar regulation and for helping your body to properly store or get glucose into your cells. And so low levels of potassium can lead to elevations in, in insulin, right, which can contribute to an increased risk for heart disease, but also elevations of, of potassium can lead to a sugar craving effect. So let's make a little bit of room here. So if we've got, again, if, if, we're, if low potassium is increasing insulin, and which over time causes an increase in insulin resistance, right? This in and of itself can contribute to diabetes. And we're talking predominantly here type, type 2 diabetes. Um, and elevations in blood sugar. So again, when your insulin is, when your body's resistant to the insulin that you're producing, we get an elevation in, in blood glucose or blood sugar. And that elevation um, leads to the storage or the formation of fat, right? So then your body will take that extra sugar and it will store it as triglycerides, which is, a, which is basically is what goes into your fat cells, makes them bigger. So if you're trying to lose weight, one of the issues, and a lot of people go on, for example, a ketogenic diet um, to, to do their weight loss in a ketogenic diet, just depending on what your diet consists of, but some of them, especially if you're leaning more toward, let's say like a carnivore based diet can be lower in potassium. And so what can happen to these individuals, if, if they're not making sure that they're getting adequate potassium, it can lead to, uh, in a sense, an elevation in blood sugar and actually hinder their ability so, to lose weight. So if you've ever gone on a ketogenic diet and weren't super successful, you might really consider the, the fact that potassium, your potassium might have been too low when you were, when you were doing that diet and uh, potentially think about how you could get your potassium levels up. Again, we'll talk about that here shortly and in just a minute. Now, potassium also plays a role in bone and kidney health as a mineral, very important for your, your bone health, very important for your kidney function. So potassium has a lot of really critical key roles, but it's oftentimes ignored because, again, it, it's ignored by a lot of functional doctors because there's really no great supplement for potassium. And a lot of doctors, if you can't give it in a supplement, they are not really interested in talking about it or they lose focus or attention on it. And most medical doctors don't get enough or adequate nutritional training to really understand it very well or to understand the, the symptoms associated with it. And so it oftentimes largely goes unignored. Now, one of the other reasons why is that most of the time when you go to the doctor, they'll, they'll do a test uh, called a chem, chem panel or a chemistry panel. And this chemistry panel usually does have, it will measure your, your potassium levels. Um, but your, your, your blood levels or your serum levels of potassium, remember potassium works in the blood, but it also works in the cell. It works in the nerve. It works intracellularly. So the best way to really measure potassium is not in the blood. And the reason why is your body does a really good job of keeping those levels pretty constant. And that, you know, just depending on which lab, you know, the range is, you know, anywhere from three and a half to about, to about, oh, what's happening here? It's about five, uh, 5.2, 5.3, somewhere in that neighborhood. So again, depending on the lab, the, the reference range can vary just a little bit, but your, again, this is your serum or your blood potassium level. The best way to look at potassium, though, is not this. If this is, if this is skewed, you've got problems. If this is really low, you've got problems, and these things are already happening. These problems over here are already occurring. So, so you don't want to wait for a test like this. If you really suspect your potassium is low, you want to ask your doctor to run an RBC potassium level. 
Um, this is a form of intracellular potassium measurement. So red blood cells, what that stands for, RBC potassium levels, a much more accurate way to try to assess potassium. So again, don't just rely on that serum level because your body does a really good job of keeping that level pretty stable. Okay, so let's talk about some of the symptoms. You know, before disease sets in, what are some of the symptoms that, uh, that potassium, the potassium deficiency can create? And I mentioned this a minute ago, but fatigue. Fatigue is a big one, uh, and this is because your muscles require potassium to contract. Your brain requires potassium to think, right? So we get tired, we get brain fog. A big one, one of the early ones that I see is muscle weakness, muscle spasm. So if you have, you know, another way to say this is cramps. If you're waking up with cramps, if you're having twitches, muscle twitches, involuntary, uh, if your toes or your feet cramp up when you try to get in bed at night, you might have an issue with potassium. Now other minerals, other electrolytes can do this too, which is why you, you really, if you're not sure, um, you really want to get clarity. Uh, through, in my opinion, through testings, because magnesium deficiency can cause cramping, calcium deficiency can cause cramping as well. Things like CoQ10 deficiency can cause cramping. So more than just potassium can create this, but this is not a. This is actually a very common symptom. A regular heartbeat as well. Again, magnesium can cause that irregular heartbeat, which some doctors refer to as arrhythmia. So you got to be careful not to just jump to the conclusion of potassium. You got to also consider that magnesium and calcium might be playing a role in these two. So I, I say that uh, because those three minerals have a lot of overlap in terms of their deficiency symptoms. High blood pressure. I mentioned that earlier. I said high blood pressure. Again, high blood pressure can also be caused by magnesium and calcium deficiency. If you've been following me for any length of time, you may have heard me refer to uh, what are called the DASH studies. DASH. That stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. So these are studies that have been ongoing. They're a massive group of studies that have been ongoing for decades now. And what these studies summarize, if you're trying to stop high blood pressure from a diet perspective, there's two things that you have to make sure of. Is number one is that you're getting adequate potassium. K plus is potassium, that's an abbreviation for potassium. You also make sure that you get adequate magnesium and adequate calcium. Those three, that's what the DASH studies, again, decades worth of research show that these three minerals are critical for regulating blood pressure. Again, these three minerals, the reason I mentioned these other two tonight is because their symptoms overlap, the deficiency symptoms overlap. So this is one, number one. Number two is don't eat processed foods, because why? Because typically they're low in potassium, magnesium, and calcium, but they're also high in sodium. Salt, okay, sodium chloride oftentimes, or high in MSG, which is a form of salt, right? And so too much of this type of salt and not enough of these types of mineral salts leads to an elevation in blood pressure Again, we're talking about dietary approaches to stop high blood pressure. Potassium, very, very critical. Potassium deficiency can elevate your blood pressure. Now, I want to talk a little bit about a concept that I think is super important for you all to understand. So we know if potassium, if, if your potassium is low, it can increase your blood pressure we said a minute ago it can increase your insulin, okay? It can increase your blood sugar or glucose. What do these three things have in common? These three things are all risk factors for heart disease. But what I really want you to understand is that if a doctor I diagnoses you with increases in blood pressure, insulin resistance, and high blood sugar, what typically is going to happen is you're going to get a diuretic to lower your blood pressure. 
Uh, depending on what stage of diabetes you're in, if you're really late stage, it actually can give you insulin. Oftentimes, we'll give you insulin. Remember, too much insulin will lower your will lower your um, potassium. But they oftentimes will give you with this combination. They'll put you on a statin, which is a drug that lowers cholesterol. A lot of times, they'll put you on a, a, a blood sugar drug, uh, typically like metformin, very common one. Okay, and that's, this is a very common combination that I see when people come to see me. So diuretic, statin, metformin. Now the diuretic will deplete potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So that's important to understand that diuretic can do that. The statin, the statin will lead to reduction in CoQ10. Okay, and the metformin will cause CoQ10 and B12 and folate deficiencies. Now, why do I point all this out? Because again, this one mineral can cause these three problems that then can lead to these three classes of medications that then can lead to depletion of these key nutrients. When you start depleting, again, I mentioned the diuretic depletes potassium earlier, but when you deplete potassium, CoQ10, B12, folate, what are you actually doing? You're increasing your risk for the development of heart disease. So the very combination of medicines that your doctor's got you taking is a cocktail that spells disaster for long-term risk for cardiovascular disease, but you're being told that you need to be on these medications to prevent heart disease. And I, and I say that because this is so common. This is actually one of the most common trifectas or trios of drugs, again, that I see in people. So I think it's important for you to understand that if, if, if you're here, again, if you're here and nobody's ever measured your potassium, this is really, before you jump to these things, you know, ask your doctor to measure your potassium, your intracellular potassium, your red blood cell potassium. Otherwise, you might end up on all these things and it may increase your risk for developing heart disease in a different way. And you don't, you know, you don't want to trade one risk for heart disease for multiple others through nutritional deficiency. Okay, other symptoms of potassium deficiency, bloating and constipation, uh, numbness and tingling. Potassium deficiency can cause a, a sense of neuropathy, numbness and tingling. Typically this for potassium occurs in your hands, in your legs and feet. It can create, especially if it goes on long enough. So I mentioned earlier muscle weakness, muscle spasm or cramps, but it can also cause muscle paralysis. Now this is super important because some of the muscles help your, rib, your ribs lift, right? We call those the breathing accessory muscles. These muscles help you to lift your rib cage so that you can fill your lungs with air. So if, if you're developing muscular paralysis, one of the earlier signs of muscular paralysis is going to be shortness of breath or difficulty breathing because it's, again, not, not pure paralysis, but it's a reduction or a weakness in those accessory breathing muscles. And so you, you, you think maybe you're anemic now. So this is where sometimes potassium deficiency can be misconstrued for anemia because anemia, like iron deficiency, can also cause every, uh, a shortness of breath or trouble breathing. So potassium does it not so much through red blood cells and oxygen, but it does so through the, the, you know, the weakness that evolves and develops in the, in the respiratory muscles, the muscles that help you breathe. So difficulty breathing can be a sign of potassium deficiency. And then mood swings. Low level, remember, potassium is an electrolyte. It allows your nerves in your head, in your brain, to communicate with each other. It allows the same nerve to communicate with your spinal cord. And so mood swings are a very common symptom of potassium deficiency as well. Okay, so now let's talk about diseases, like full-blown diseases that we know can, can result as a result of potassium deficiency. And one of them is kidney stones. Uh, so if you've ever been diagnosed with a kidney stone, uh, this is, this, ask, again, ask your doctor, measure potassium. Let's change our color here. Let's get something a little bit easier to read. So measure that potassium if again, if you've ever been diagnosed with kidney stones, you gotta, you gotta make sure that your potassium levels are normal. Heart disease, again, this could be heart arrhythmias, heart palpitations. It could also be elevations in blood pressure, which is a form, many people consider to be a form of heart disease. Vasoconstriction of your blood vessels, they don't dilate very well. That's why the pressure goes up. Well, that can reduce your oxygen to your other tissues and lead to all types of problems. 
Bone loss is associated, or osteoporosis is associated with long-term potassium deficiency. Stroke can be a condition caused by potassium deficiency. This is what I was saying earlier, is that this is one of the nutrients, right? It's essential, meaning your body can't produce it. You have to eat it. You have to get enough in your diet. And when you're low, when you're too low over time, it can kill you, right? And the way it kills you, death, right, is through, these are some of those mechanisms. So type 2 diabetes, again, again, what did we say earlier? We said that potassium could reduce your insulin. That could lead to the doctor wanting to put you on a diabetic medication that can actually have side effects nutritionally that increase your risk for the development of heart disease. And so then we also have a disease called encephalopathy, which is the swelling of the brain and mental dysfunction or mental disorders. Now, what's interesting here, um, you know, mental disorders, some like depression is an example or bipolar with these types of diseases, there are certain meds that doctors will prescribe, certain antipsychotic meds or certain um, uh, medications, uh, emotional medications that lead to increase in blood sugar, right? That affect your potassium as well. They, 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 so a lot of your antipsychotic medications will actually contribute to diabetes and, and again, increase your blood sugar, thus increasing your risk for the development of a potassium deficiency. So you gotta be careful there. So those of you listening to this that are on these medications, again, don't stop your medicines. That's the conversation that you need to have with your prescribing doctor. What you really wanna do is you, is you wanna go in there armed with this information so that you can ask for the right type of testing. Okay, so I've, I've, I've talked a lot about the different potential for medications, but this is a list. You can see here, this is a list of some of the medications that we're absolutely certain will cause potassium deficiency. And one is steroids. So corticosteroids, cortisol, corticosteroids will deplete potassium. One of the reasons why we know this is because so many people go on corticosteroids to block inflammation and we'll see their potassium levels start to drop. So if, you're, if you've ever you know, suffered or struggled with chronic inflammation, chronic autoimmune disease, chronic pain, and your doctors have you on a cortico, corticosteroid, something like prednisone or methylprednisone, et cetera, you know that one of the side effects is, is potassium depletion. Now, now, on the same token, if you also, if you have intense stress in your life, so if you're under a lot of stress, your body is going to produce cortisol, more cortisol of your own. And this is one of the reasons why chronic stress will also deplete potassium levels. So you, you again, Chronic stress causes your body to make the hormone that lowers potassium, but taking the, the synthetic versions of that same hormone will also deplete potassium levels. So be aware of that because again, if you're, if you're taking medicine or if you're chronically stressed, you need, to, you need to consider having your potassium monitored or measured to see whether or not it, it's something that, that uh, is going to be needed to be elevated. Aspirin can deplete. Aspirin and other NSAIDs non anti-inflammatory medications can deplete potassium. And one of the ways is through uh, damage to your kidney, but also to your intestine. Uh, inflammation in your intestine depletes your body's ability to absorb potassium. And we see this, this is super common. For those of you, again, who, who followed me, maybe some of you are celiac diagnosed, uh, or maybe some of you are what are non-celiac gluten sensitive, right? Where you have a gluten issue, um, but you don't have celiac disease, but the damage to your gut is there, this can actually cause uh, potassium deficiency in a big way. We'll see this too in people that have like chronic vomiting or chronic diarrhea, again, inflammatory bowel disease. So it's not just celiac disease, but it can also be Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So again, if you've got those diagnoses, you know, you want, to be, you want to be a little bit more concerned about the potential, right, that you're depleting your potassium through, you know, through, through malabsorption, okay? And then, again, going back to the NSAIDs, non steroidal inflammatories like aspirin, but between the damage to the kidney and the intestine, um, it, it, it can reduce your ability to absorb potassium. Now, something else you should know, when you add, some people are taking steroids plus aspirin, okay? So there's like a one-two, they're doing them both. When you add these two together, they work synergistically and they create even more gut damage. So it's important to know that too. If, you're, if your doctor's putting you on both, 
then, then, then the effect is even greater and can create greater degrees of side effects. Additionally, we have diuretics here. Diuretics, as I've mentioned a number of times, uh, diuretics deplete potassium. And as they deplete potassium, can create the very disease that they're intended to treat. Remember, for most people, what are the diuretics treating? Excessive fluid retention or, or high blood pressure, right? And so again, when you lower potassium, that you actually will increase blood pressure. So again, if you're being treated for high blood pressure and your doctor's not monitoring your potassium, but you're taking a diuretic, um, you definitely want to make sure that you ask when next time you go visit your doc and say, hey, look, we need to be monitoring my potassium. I'm aware that this drug can deplete it. Now, interestingly enough, some blood pressure medications will actually elevate your potassium. And so there, there's another side to this. Too much potassium can also create problems. And, and so um, there's a class of, of medications called ARBs. That stands for angiotensin receptor blockers. These particular medicines actually increase your potassium and can put you in danger because increased potassium can also be deadly and can be dangerous. Now, interestingly enough, this same class of medication here has also been shown to cause villus atrophy, to cause the same damage to the intestines that gluten can cause. So um, again, something worth noting because there are, I think at this, to last I checked, about 130 studies or so that show that that this class of medications cause villus atrophy in certain people, not in everyone, but in some people, and you wanna be aware of that, especially if you've been diagnosed with gluten sensitivity and you're taking that medication. And then lastly, we have antibiotics. Antibiotics are also known to deplete potassium. So if you've been, you know, chronically been using antibiotics, you know, I, sometimes people come into my office and, you know, they'll tell me, you know, when I was a kid for the first 18 months of, of my life, my parents had me on antibiotics or, They'll tell me, hey, look, I've struggled and battled with chronic urinary tract infections, and so I've been on antibiotics in total, you know, four or five years of my life have been taking antibiotics, and nobody's ever even bothered to measure that potassium level or, or consider potassium as a potential for many of the symptoms that they were experiencing. So it's important to know if you're taking any of these medicines or if you have a strong history of using any of these medicines and you have any of these problems here or any of these symptoms here, then you definitely want to have that conversation with your doctor and get more investigation done because otherwise, um, you know, what could very, very well be a simple problem to fix may turn into a major catastrophe. Now, let's talk about food sources for potassium. Now, if you're trying to supplement, a lot of people say, well, what's the best set potassium supplement? Um, potassium supplements, generally speaking, um, you're not going to get them higher than 99 milligrams uh, per dose. So, like, if 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 you you know if there's one you know if you're taking a pill, a pill form of potassium, 99 milligrams per dose is about the max of what a pill can contain, and that's that's in a sense that's pretty kind of problematic because. In order to get your daily recommended intake of potassium, you need about 4,700 milligrams a day, right? So basically, you'd need 47 pills if they were 99 milligram doses, and that's not real realistic um, to do. So it's not a super effective way to get your potassium levels up. You know, by contrast, a banana has, you know, a medium-sized banana has about 400 milligrams of potassium. So this is about 10%, maybe a little bit less of your total daily need. And then if you're eating things like spinach, your chard, your dark green leafies, your Brussels sprouts, your broccoli, your asparagus, your cabbage and kale, um, if you have a nice, decent salad, you know, over the course of your day, you incorporate, uh, you know, seven to 10 ounces of these, of these things into a, again, into a nice meal, you're going to get a lot more potassium bang for your buck. This is really where you're gonna get the bulk of your potassium. Now potato, some of you don't wanna eat white potato because maybe you're on a ketogenic diet, so this may not be an option for you where now these greens are gonna be a major option for you because they're super low carbohydrate. They're predominantly very low carb and protein, but super, super rich in potassium. So again, those of you following a ketogenic diet, you're gonna do better with some of these greens, okay? 
Those of you not really following a ketogenic diet, following no grain, no pain, which is, which is basically, it's not a ketogenic diet. It's, it's, we follow what's called the rule of thirds, where you get about a third of your calories from fats, a third from carbon, a third from protein. So it's a more balanced diet. But all of these things are acceptable unless you're sensitive or allergic to them, right? Now, some people say, well, what about meat? Because there's, a, there's a, a crowd of folks out there that are following this really aggressive carnivore-style diet. And you get potassium from meat. But, you know, as, as, as to quantity, let me give you an example. Three or four ounces, let's just say you're eating turkey. Um, you're going to get, you know, about 400 milligrams. The same you might get uh, 400 milligrams of potassium in that serving. Same amount you might get in a banana, right? A good-sized banana. So, um same thing with beef. If you eat six ounce steak, for example, you might get about 400, four to 500 milligrams of potassium from that. So it's not that meat is totally devoid. And again, if you're selecting, you know, free range organic, grass fed, those are all good choices. Um, and again, if you're, if you're not a vegetarian, those are all good choices, but pound for pound, right? In terms of quantity, in terms of size of food, you can get so, far much or far more potassium from vegetables than you can get potassium from meats. You'd have to eat an awful lot of meat to get to that 4,700 milligrams a day. And for many people, that quantity of meat uh, can be constipation, can create constipation, which by the way is another symptom, of, can be another symptom of potassium deficiency. I didn't mention that earlier, but constipation and sleep disturbance can both be symptoms of potassium deficiency as well. But so you, if you're trying to hit this level, one of the best ways to do it in the least amount of calories, but the, in, in some of the most nutrient dense foods is, is, to, is to go with your greens, okay? And sweet potatoes, another really excellent source, very, very high source of, uh, of, of potassium. Beets are a high source, but the greens on the top of the beets, the mustard greens, the beet greens, those are also rich in potassium. So again, do your best to try to get, uh, to try to get greens on a daily basis in your diet. You'll, you'll bring your potassium levels closer to that 4,700 milligrams a day than with just meat alone. Uh, and again, supplements, to do supplementation to get adequate potassium, you'd have to be swallowing an awful lot of pills and it's just not practical for most of you. So let's open it up for questions. Those of you who've got questions about potassium or related topic around potassium that we talked about tonight, let's get those answered. Okay. Um, Gwendolyn is asking, any tips for weaning off diuretics? Scroll down just a little bit, not, um, not taken for blood pressure. You know, ultimately I can't give you medical advice, but what I, what I can tell you is look, have a conversation with your prescribing doctor. Typically the way diuretics are, are weaned is, is just that, that you don't just quit them cold turkey, but you titrate. So work with your doctor to figure out what dose it, they want you to titrate down, but it's not a, it's not a, you're taking them for years and then all of a sudden cold turkey, you stop. That'll create a lot of fluid swelling uh, and fluid issues for you. So that would probably be a bad idea. So again, work with, a, work with that doctor to wean it down. Uh, let's see, Shanquilla wants to know, um, is there spinach in my B complete B vitamin product, and should I avoid if sensitive on food sensitivity testing? Uh, no, there's no spinach in my B complete. There, there, we we do have a spinach extract in our our uh, what's called 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is a form of methylated folate. But uh, there's no no there's no spinach in that in that B complete. Uh, what do you recommend as a substitute for Dulcolax? I have to take it to, um, to prep, but think it might have gluten for the colonoscopy. Oh, for, so you're talking about a colonoscopy. Um, well, get this, you know, you got to approve this through your GI doctor. But one of the things I've had in, in, in you know, when I've worked with other GI doctors and their, and their patients, as we, as we have them do a, a colonoscopy prep using uh, a vitamin C flush, it's very effective. Vitamin C is a very effective way to clean out the bowel because of its osmotic effect. So a vitamin C flush the way it's done is you is you start you know if you're trying to prep for the colonoscopy the next day then you would do this flush in the evening and you'd take basically you take two teaspoons which is equivalent to about six grams uh, vitamin C, 
okay? Every 15 minutes until you had diarrhea. And once you start, once, you, once your bowels start moving, you discontinue the use of taking any more of that vitamin C and let it run its course. But what vitamin C does is it's an osmotic, so it's gonna pull water into your bowel and it's gonna flush them out. It's a very safe way to go about doing it. But again, I, I would say if you're, if you're planning on doing this, you wanna get with your GI doctor and just you know, talk to them about it. But this is one way, uh, one way, and this is a gluten-free alternative to sometimes some of those prep kits do contain gluten and they're just not really all that healthy for you. And to me, I, I always question, you know, I've talked to a number of GI doctors and one of the questions I've, I've asked frequently is, why would you give your patient a colonoscopy prep that actually can irritate their bowel right before you're getting ready to look at it? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Wouldn't it be best to give them something clean and potentially healthy uh, that can also cleanse them out without, without the potential creation of damage that you might then in turn see and misdiagnose on a colonoscopy. So again, conversation you need to have with that doc, but what you gotta be careful about vitamin C preps is a lot of them contain corn, GMO corn. Most vitamin C's nowadays are made from GMO corn, so you wanna be real cautious about that. If you're, if you're interested in a powdered form of vitamin C, what I would recommend is a product called Detox C. Which is, a, which is a wild African potato, that's what it's derived from. So it's, uh, you're not gonna get that corn effect. So if you're talking, oh, so Christy's asking about a right bundle branch blockage in the heart, which is an electrical conduction problem within the heart. Um, can potassium help with that? Maybe. You know, the, the, the proof is proverbial in the pudding. Does potassium play a role in, in the electrical conductivity of the heart muscle? It sure does, but potassium may or may not be your problem. So really what I would suggest before recommending a lot of potassium is really get with your doctor and have them measure your calcium, your magnesium, your potassium. Those are the primary electrolytes, right? So get a read on what those things are doing. And then if anything's low, then you can, you can supplement accordingly. Let's see. Um, yeah, so Nathaniel's saying, hello, doctor. Can you tell me why most potassium supplements have only 99 milligrams? What can you recommend? Uh, so th there's a reason why. That's because um, potassium can kill you if you overdose on potassium. Now, so, so a long time ago, the, legally, the law was set to, to limit the, the amount of potassium per dose to be 99 milligrams. So that's that's the reasoning behind it. To me, it doesn't make any sense because you, like I said earlier, you can get 400 milligrams of potassium from eating a banana. So technically, according to the FDA, um, a banana actually uh, would be illegal in terms of being a potassium supplement. Uh, but anyway, that's just the way it is, man. That's just, uh, that's just the way it is. And so you, you can't buck uh, the system. You, you can work your way around it. But the best way to get potassium regardless is through food. It's one of the few supplements I would say food is absolutely the best method to get this nutrient. And there's plenty of foods that contain plenty of this nutrient where most people go wrong is they eat highly processed diets. And highly processed diets um, are high, usually high in sugar, which deplete potassium. Um, and, and so they also spike insulin and they'll spike your cortisol, which depletes potassium even further, which is one of the reasons why if you just don't eat garbage you, and you eat real food, you should be able to get enough potassium without having to supplement with it. Um, let's see here. Do cooked vegetables spike your insulin compared to raw vegetables? I haven't seen anything that's scientific evidence that's compelling enough for me to say cooked vegetables spike your insulin more than raw um, at all. Uh, vegetables pretty much don't spike your insulin. I mean, there, there are exceptions. You know, when I say spike, I mean, you might get a small lift if you're eating carrot uh, or, a, or a higher glycemic type of vegetable, root vegetables predominantly, potatoes, carrots, etc. But will cooked ones do it more than raw? No, I haven't seen, again, I haven't seen any compelling evidence that says that, that, they, sh that they do. Um, I take NP thyroid. That's, uh, that's a form of thyroid medication. And I read that the side effect is muscle cramps, which I get almost every night. Should the electrolytes help with this? Um, maybe, maybe they will. It depends though. If, if, if NP thyroid is causing 
your cramps. Taking more electrolytes probably won't solve the problem. Uh, one of the things that sometimes will happen if, when doctors put patients on, on drugs like NP thyroid or Synthroid or Tyrosent or any of the other you know, major thyroid medications is if they don't, they have, you know, they should monitor it. I mean, I, I, I'd not say that your doctor's not monitoring it, but monitor your TSH because what can happen is if your dose of NP thyroid is too high, then your TSH is going to be less than 0.5. And that, that's a scenario I'll see a lot. I'll see people that will come in to see me with muscle cramps. Um, and what we'll find is that their prescribing doctor had them on a, on a thyroid medicine and their TSH levels were like 0.05, 10 times lower than what it should be, right? And so what basically what that was doing is it was, oh, they were being over-medicated with thyroid hormone. And remember that too much thyroid, right? Too much thyroid medicine can increase spasm and muscle pain and cause hair loss. And so just like not enough thyroid can cause cramps, too much can also cause it. And so that's where I would, you know, ask your doctor to check your TSH. If your TSH is, is, is super low, you're, you're probably being over-medicated. If your T4 is too high, you might be being over-medicated. So a good thyroid workup is what I would suggest you talk with your doctor about to get to the root of whether or not it's the medicine creating the cramp or whether it's something like an electrolyte or a potassium deficiency or, or another nutritional deficiency creating the cramp, because it, it, it could be a lot of different things and you don't wanna just assume uh, and take a bunch of potassium because that might not help you. Uh, let's see here. How much fiber is too much? Uh, that, that question is dependent on the individual. Uh, as far as fiber is concerned, you know, in average between 25, 35 grams of fiber a day is, is, is pretty okay for most people. But some people are FODMAP sensitive. Some individuals have gut problems or have microbiome problems where they don't process fiber very well. And so even going over 10 or 15 grams of fiber a day for that individual might be too much. So it just depends on the individual as to the answer to that question. Uh, does taking a lot of magnesium cancel out potass potassium absorption? They, they can compete, um, but I've never seen a case of somebody supplementing magnesium actually cause a potassium deficiency. Um, so, so in my experience, that's, that, that doesn't hold out or that doesn't hold water. So, okay, so Lily, uh, hi, Dr. Osborne, good to hear you and your family are okay. Been following your no grain, no pain diet for three years and love it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for acknowledging that. Um, question, is amlodipine and or Lexapro, do those deplete uh, electrolytes? Uh, amlodipine, I believe there's some research on amlodipine causing not so much potassium deficit. I actually think it's the opposite. I want to say that that particular medicine causes... And or potentially can cause an elevation in potassium. So if that's something you're taking, I'd look more toward that as opposed to deficiency. Uh, let's see here. Uh, as, far as, as far as the other medication that you mentioned, the SSRI, no, I've not seen anything that shows that SSRIs deplete potassium, although um, we could say that they can affect the electrolyte balance over time because they overstimulate the nerve. And remember the nerve ending is controlled by, by regulation between sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. So there's, there's specialized gated channels in your nerve tissue that open and close. And the more you stimulate your nerve with an SSRI, the more, the more theoretically you could, you could cause depletion of those electrolytes. But I haven't seen anything in the research uh, about that, so I can't make that claim. Let's see here. Uh, Joseph says, I went from a keto diet to carnivore and eventually started getting leg pain, fatigue, breathing problems. Now I'm back on keto with leafy greens and cruciferous veg and the problems went away. Yeah, Joseph, so that's a classic example. Thank you for sharing your story. That's classic of somebody with, uh, with, who went too far and started to develop that potassium deficiency. If you're going to do keto and, and you're going to go carnivore, you know, my advice is really research the nutritional deficiencies around that so that you're not creating the potential for a problem. Because 
any diet to any extreme is going to create the potential for nutritional imbalance. And then there's also what you eat, what you like, what you don't like, etc. So it's always good to, to measure nutrition. I'd say if there's one thing a person could do preventatively across the board to make their health uh, solid and, and to maintain great health, it's to monitor nutritional status. Because ultimately, remember, the only thing that your body requires essentially speaking, meaning the, 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 the group of nutrients that your body requires are called essential nutrients, are your vitamins, your minerals. Those are essential, right? Without them, you die. So monitoring them and maintaining uh, adequate levels of those nutrients is very, very important for overall health. Why, why most doctors don't recognize that and don't train in it is beyond me, but uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, Allison, my labs have shown high potassium, but I cannot get my doctor to address it. My adrenal counselor, however, told me to take half a teaspoon of salt in water daily. It's not gonna do anything to your potassium so much. You need to figure out why it's elevated. If Allison, if you're on medicines that can cause elevation in your potassium, that would be my first question. Again, if you're, if you're taking medicines, some medicines elevate potassium. So, so if you're coming back chronically high, that's my, in my experience, that's typically when people come back chronically high, it's because they're on a drug that's artificially elevating their potassium. So you really got to get that part figured out because taking salt is not going to, it's not going to fix that problem. Remember high levels of potassium can, can put you into arrhythmia. It can be a life-threatening situation. So you don't want to let that slide long-term without get, looking into it. Uh, reason for too much weight gain in pregnancy without eating too much. Any ideas? Yeah, your body's trying to gain weight because that baby needs, uh, needs, <laughs> needs more caloric intake. Um, there's a normal, I mean, depending on, you know, some, so there's, if you're, if you're gaining more weight than what the doctor's charts or the OBGYN's chart is saying you should be gaining and you're rapidly gaining, it could be fluid gain. You, you might have uh, kind of an underlying gestational diabetes issue. And so looking at, looking at your ratio of carbs, fats, and proteins, looking at the quantity of sugar you might be consuming or carbohydrate that you might consuming could cause that. But, but you know, specifically, women gain weight during pregnancy. So again, without specifics, it's hard for me to, to dial in on that too much. Um, Uh, Jean's asking, why should I avoid magnesium stearate in supplements? I see it in many. You, you shouldn't. There was an old mythical article somebody wrote years ago on how magnesium stearate is, is, is bad, but it isn't. There's no great research that sh shows that magnesium stearate creates a problem or creates a soapy film in the gut. It was an actually, it was an ex vivo, it was an ex vivo experiment that, that you know, you can't take an ex vivo study and, and apply it to, to human conditions. So, um, there's a, a lot of fear mongering around magnesium stearate and I, I don't agree with it. I, I, I tend to actually very much disagree with it. Magnesium stearate is a, is a, what's called a flow agent. And, and so when you're trying to get uh, a level of magnesium into a capsule and you're trying to get each capsule to be equal to a certain level of magnesium, um, scientists use flow agents. Uh, uh, nutrition supplement companies use flow agents to make sure that that dose is consistent with each capsule and with each pill and without a flow agent it's very very hard to do so I, I don't I don't I don't share that same pessimism about about magnesium stearate can I explain MTHFR and COMT gene mutations um, boy that's a that's a topic for another night um, and yeah, we can get into that certainly another night. I can give you kind of a general synopsis. If you're, if you're, if you're positive for MTHFR, it doesn't really mean a whole lot unless you're surrounded by a toxic environment where, where people with MTHFR mutations really pay a price is if they're eating poorly or they're being exposed to environmental poisons and don't know it because you need MTHFR to help your liver and, and, your, and your detoxification pathways, to help your methylation pathways. But just having a mutation um, without being exposed to major toxins, et cetera, is not generally not something that you have to worry about. Um, I have an MTHFR mutation. I don't take extra folate or methylfolate. Um, and my, um, my methylation factors, when I measure them in my blood, uh, are perfectly fine. So don't, don't put so much heavy. A lot of people want to put heavy, heavy weight on, on gene mutations or gene SNPs. You guys may or may not know this about me. 20 years ago, I was one of the first doctors in the world. Actually, I used to lecture uh, on this very topic of, of 
uh, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms and genetic mutations are uh, associated with, with nutritional issues. And we actually, in our, in our practice, in my practice, we, we did a lot of research around this area. I actually developed one of the, helped develop one of the first uh, genetic mutation tests that went, ever went to market. And we did five years of, of research in this area. And what I found repetitively over and over again is that you can't supplement genes and make people's problems go away. People's problems aren't their genes. Remember this. Always remember this. Your genes are a gift from God. They're a gift. You are graced with your genes. They're not curses. They're not evil. They're not bad. What happens is if you have certain genetic predisposition and you make bad choices that make those genes that maybe don't work as well as somebody else's optimally in that situation or that circumstance, that's when problems can start to set in. But that's not the fault of the gene. That's the fault of the individual's choice. So, so, for example, if you have a COMT gene, okay, I'm, I'm talking about a COMT, that, that stands for catecholomethyltransferase. It's a gene that helps methylate and create new DNA, new RNA, nucleic acids. So, basically, helps your body create the building blocks for making new cells, but it also helps you metabolize estrogen. So, if you have, uh, if you're taking, if you've got a COMT mutation and you're taking heavy doses of estrogen, um, as, as birth control pills or as, as you know, postmenopausal for hot flashes, that's probably a bad idea because if you can't properly methylate your estrogen, then your body, that, your body can't get rid of that estrogen and it builds up types of estrogens that are more conducive to creating cancer. But again, it's not the gene that creates that scenario. It's the environmental choice of choosing to take that drug in this scenario. Again, I'm just giving you basic examples here. But um, don't don't put too much weight on your genes unless you're in a toxic environment. And step one with that is not, don't supplement your genes. I've seen this happen time and time again. Doctors try to supplement people's genetics saying your genes are bad. Your genes aren't bad. Your genes are a gift. You need to make better choices and you need to identify things in your environment that are creating the strain on your genes. That's really where it's at. Um, so anyway... Why is the symbol for potassium a K and not a P? <laughs> Good question. Because chemists, uh, chemists set this up many, many, many years ago, and the, the symbol for potassium is a K, just like the symbol for sodium isn't an S, it's an NA, right? So that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, is, salt, is Celtic sea salt, or Celtic salt rather, good to provide adequate potassium and other important minerals? No, I mean, not all, not by itself, not in and of itself. You, you really, if you're trying to get your minerals, you know, you need to eat, you can use Celtic salt and it's, it is a good source of minerals, but it isn't going to provide all the minerals. If you just rely on that as a source of minerals, probably not going to provide everything you need. Uh, let's see. What about a diuretic? Let's see. I can't, uh, diuretic, um, for taking testosterone. Does that deplete it too? I'm not sure I understand your question. Scroll up just a little bit on that one. Um, the question doesn't make sense. Sorry, Nicole. Uh, maybe retype it. But a diuretic for taking testosterone. And if, if what you're asking me is, is, is if you're taking testosterone, does testosterone deplete your potassium? Uh, the answer, the simple answer is no, not really. It's that, that's not one that we know that really depletes potassium. But, but the diuretic certainly can. Um, let's see. So somebody mentioned, uh, coffee and I would say this too. Um, if you're a heavy caffeine user, we didn't really talk about that tonight. Heavy caffeine use can also deplete your potassium. This is why people that are multiple cup drinkers end up with cramps. It's one of the reasons why you, you can, you can, you, you know, deplete through that diuretic action of coffee. Remember, Diuretics can be drugs, but caffeine's a diuretic drug too. So overconsumption of it. I'm not talking about one cup a day or a cup of green tea here or there. I'm talking about heavy users of caffeine. So all those energy drinks, multiple cups of coffee, those can, can definitely through diuretic action deplete your potassium. How many bananas can you eat a day? How many would you like to eat? There's not like a magic number. I would say you, where you get into trouble with bananas is the sugar content. If you, you know, if you have a banana a day, probably not the end of the road for you, but if you're eating four or five bananas a day, now you're getting a lot of heavy sugar. So it depends on what else you're also eating that might also have sugars in it. You can overdo any food. 
Uh, do golden beets have a good amount of potassium? No, golden beets do have a good amount of potassium. And really where beets are richest in potassium is the top. The beet top, that's the greens that come off the top. A lot of people throw that part out, eat the beets, but the beet greens are really rich in potassium. Is psyllium husk an appropriate, fi an appropriate fiber to take daily to avoid constipation? No, I mean, not, not no, yes. Psyllium husk is a great fiber. Um, I actually have a, a fiber product, Rita, called Ultra Fiber, and, um, and it's perfectly safe to take daily uh, to help get your fiber levels up. And psyllium is grain-free, so there's no grain in psyllium. Psyllium is a, uh, is a basically, it's, um, it's, it's, it's plant material, but it isn't from grain at all. Um, why would a test show high potassium when someone doesn't eat a lot of potassium foods? There could be a number of reasons why you might have high potassium. For you, Remember what I said earlier, is a big reason why we'll see high potassium in an individual and doctors aren't addressing it, is I said one of them is that corticosteroid. So you could be taking a corticosteroid and that can drive up your potassium. But another reason why, this is probably the biggest reason, is this one right here. Um, because that, that, that high, high stress initially can cause a bump in your potassium over time, the longer it's there, chronic high stress will lead to reductions. But acute stress can, can create a bump in your potassium. So it just depends on, 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 again, on how long your potassium has been high, how long you've been trying to deal with it. But I, I, I would generally say most people's high potassium, high potassium, again, high, is caused as a result of using certain medications that are known to affect the way the kidney balances potassium, okay? Because an important part of what your kidney does is it maintains, it preserves potassium or it excretes potassium if you have too much. It's a great regulator of your potassium level. And, uh, and if you're taking medicines that have to be metabolized through the kidney or that affect the kidney, this is where a lot of times we're gonna see individuals start to develop high levels of potassium. Is it ever too late to reverse potassium deficiency? Yeah, there's one scenario, Josie, where it's too late and that's when you're dead. Uh, but outside of that, no, it's not too late. So you're alive and you're kicking because you asked the question, so it's not too late. Okay. So can detox C be used for the colon cleanse? I think I answered that question earlier. Again, if you're gonna use detox C and try to do a colon cleanse, Clear that with your doctor first. Um, you know, I, don't, I, I can't give you medical advice here. Don't wanna uh, have that perception that I'm telling you all out there to just do a vitamin C cleanse instead of following your doctor's orders, but clear that with your doc. Uh, let's see here. I have a long, uh, Ricky saying, I have a long history of kidney stones and have had low potassium. I eat most of the high potassium foods and take potassium citrate prescribed by my uh, nephrologist, is it pointless to take to take it? Um, scroll back up. I'm not sure I. So if you, so again, Ricky, if you have a, a history of of low potassium and kidney stones, but eating those foods has corrected your potassium deficiency, um, then then you're solid. I, I'm not quite sure I understood. Uh, where your question was going, but um, again, but if you're still, if you're taking potassium supplements that have been, or potassium that's been prescribed by your doctor and you're eating potassium rich foods and you're still struggling with low potassium, you really need to get in and figure out why that's happening. You might have, you know, you might have kidney disease in a major way that's leading to potassium wasting. And that's something that you're gonna wanna have, uh, wanna have investigated. Uh, let's see here. I drink, uh, I drink one coconut water per day to increase my potassium intake as well as eating the vegetables. Are you a proponent of adding coconut water? Not really. Uh, I'm a little biased on that one though, too. Um, you know, when you say one coconut water a day, what does that look like to use it? Eight ounces, 12 ounces, 16 ounces. I've actually seen coconut, coconut water super high in sugar. And I've seen, I've seen a person Overconsume coconut water to the point where they would go to their dentist and their teeth were mottled and their teeth were, um, were loaded with cavities because of the sugar content of coconut water. So if you're going to use coconut water as a source of potassium, I would say small quantities, 
Um, and really, you're better off eating the coconut than drinking a bunch of coconut water. You don't want all that concentrated sugar. Okay. So, Marilyn, when I, when I was talking earlier about T4, I, I meant both, not just total T4, but also free T4. You look at, you, you know, your doctor, you should have them measuring both um, to get a comprehensive evaluation of your, what your thyroid's doing. So Stacy says, can you talk about red blood cell potassium is low and serum potassium is normal? What this means is that you most likely intracellularly, the potassium is not effectively getting into your cells. And there are a number of reasons why that could be the case. Um, and you might have a, a full-blown electrolyte abnormality uh, where potassium is having a harder time leaching into, into through the membrane of your cells. So that's where I would look at in that scenario. I wouldn't look at, don't look at potassium in a vacuum. Look at calcium, look at magnesium, look at your sodium levels, look at your B vitamin levels, look at your uh, other mineral levels and ensure that your, your nutrition is sound. Because I, you know, as an example, I sometimes see people with oleic acid deficiency or omega-3 deficiency, and that can make it harder for minerals to penetrate through cell membranes. And so that in and of itself can cause problems of, of deficiency. And, and so again, it, it's, it's, it's your, one nutrient in a vacuum is not how you want to analyze your nutritional status. Generally, when you're asking your doctor to look at you nutritionally, it's best to look at you comprehensively and not just looking at one or two here and there. Let's see here, Lisa, I have celiac and recently developed anemia that has me getting dizziness, heart palpitations and fatigue. I'm taking iron supplements, but it's been, uh, let's see, it's been a week and I still am so dizzy. Any suggestions? You know, the best suggestion I can give you is follow up with your, with your prescribing doctor and, and do a deeper dive. If you just were diagnosed with celiac disease, one of the major problems that you probably are struggling with is severe malnutrition across the board, not just in iron. Although iron is the most common deficiency in those that have a celiac diagnosis, you know, zinc is common, B12 is common, omega-3 fatty acids are common, vitamin D is common, and those things might also be contributing um, to your problem. B vitamin deficiency is also common and B vitamin deficiency can also cause anemia. So, you know, get a full spectrum nutritional workup. And those of you, I, I you know, we, we aired this earlier, but those of you who aren't aware, if, you, if you're new to the, to the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show, um, make sure you sign up. We'll put that link up for you, but make sure you sign up for our, our, our master class, if you, especially if you've just recently been diagnosed with celiac disease or gluten sensitivity and you're kind of trying to figure all this out, this is a, this is a master class, it's 14 hours long. Um, you'll, you'll walk away literally with, with more knowledge about how to go gluten-free than, than any doctor can ever afford to spend that time with you in a one-on-one -on -one scenario teaching you all those things. And it's free of charge, you know, it's a gift. It's my gift to, to any of you who go register. So all you have to do is go to glutenfreesociety.org forward slash master class and get signed up for that. So uh, let's see, last question here. We'll take one more here. Widmark, I'm sweating profusely now these days and become sensitive to dairy and losing weight. My labs show low testosterone. How do I, or how to know if hyperthyroidism or fatty liver? Um, so go back up to, go back up just a little bit. So if you're sweating profusely, you, that is one another one of the causes of potassium deficiency. I just thought I'd mention that since we're talking about potassium tonight. Um, but if you're losing weight, your testosterone is low, I, I would say there may be a malabsorption issue that you're struggling with. And so what I would ask your doctor to do, uh, if you know your testosterone is low and you're losing weight and they can't figure out why you're losing weight is they need to rule out gluten sensitivity because it's one of the most common causes of unexplained weight loss. And it can also cause low testosterone. So um, that would be something. Now they can also rule out hyperthyroidism. And so there's some antibodies that can be detected against um, or, or not against your thyroid, but antibodies that behave like thyroid hormone. These are called thyroglobulin stimulating antibodies. So you might ask your doctor to measure you for the uh, condition known as Graves disease, which is also uh, referred to as hyperthyroidism. So thyroid stimulating um, antibodies or thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins are, are antibodies that some people produce that behave like thyroid hormones. So it makes them lose weight and it makes them behave as if they're thyroid is working too strongly. 
So that's, that's another uh, test that can be done. As far as ruling out whether or not it's your liver, you know, an, an ultrasound of your liver, a scan of your liver would be a good thing that might show some damage to your liver. Blood tests, there's a couple different blood tests, ALT, AST, alkyl and phosphatase are blood tests. Bilirubin is a blood test that can help you rule in or out whether or not there's any potential problems going on with your liver. So hopefully all that's helpful for you. Uh, and, uh, and, and I wish you well and come back to the show and let, let us know how it turns out. Okay. Um, yeah, we're out of time. So look, thanks for spending your Monday evening with me. It's always a pleasure and I love teaching and I hope you love learning and make sure if you're not already subscribe, uh, so that we can send you updates as, as we're all in this environment of ultra censorship these days, the best way I can stay communicating with you is through my email list. So come over to glutenfreesociety.org and make sure you sign up for our free newsletter. It's the largest gluten-free newsletter in the world with a quarter million people subscribing. So join our audience, join us there where we can ensure that our communication is not, uh, is not defective or not censored, especially if you wanna tune in to future shows and, and future events that we put on educational events for you. So thanks so much again. I wish you an excellent week. We'll see you next Monday night for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.